when our churches are full of graduate degrees, we probably don't know uh, what it's like uh, to have to uh, go paycheck to paycheck and decide whether you get books for school, clothes for school, or have three meals, right? And so there's this, um, th when, it, when that happens in his life, then the question of what the gospel looks like, uh, what good news sounds like, uh, is no longer just what it would sound like in his socioeconomic cultural space. It also is, well, what is a working class family? Like, what would be good news? Today on the show, why is everyone talking about Bonhoeffer? We're joined by Dr. Trip Fuller to explore why Bonhoeffer's theological ideas, such as costly grace, the power and centrality of discipleship, and the church's role in society, as well as his courageous resistance against the Nazi regime, still feel so relevant almost a century later. Hello, everyone. I'm Dwight Shiley. And I'm Katie Langston. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast, where we explore how to follow God into a faithful future by equipping all God's people to love and lead in the way of Jesus. Yes, and we are excited to welcome Trip Fuller as our guest. Uh, Trip is a podcaster, theologian, minister, and I have it on good authority, a beer aficionado. Um, he's the uh, instructor of our forthcoming Faith Lead Academy course, Pop Gods, Thinking Theologically About Pop Culture. And then on June 11th, 2024, he's co-leading the uh, 2024 OSS lecture at Luther Seminary, along with uh, Luther professor Andy Root, called Bonhoeffer, the Gospel, and the Other, a Bonhoeffer Salon, which is a super fancy title. Um, and depending on when you're listening to this, you can either catch <laughs> it, <laughs> you can catch it live streamed for free, or you can see a replay. Uh, just go to faithlead.org slash Bonhoeffer. Um, we'll put the link in the notes in case you have a hard time spelling Bonhoeffer. Uh, and you can also catch Trip and his many projects at tripfuller.com. Welcome, Trip. Glad to be here. It's great to have you. Well, Trip, why don't you start by telling us just a bit about Dietrich Bonhoeffer for anyone who might not be particularly familiar with him? Why is he so notable? Well, I mean, I think the reason he ended up being notable is the, the, the that he's ultimately executed uh, by. Uh, by the Nazis. Um, but the other element of why I find his biography kind of compelling and why I think it stays so is uh, it, he wasn't born um, where he was just immediately aware of all the systemic and cultural changes that are going on and, and uh, you know, just was born like the perfect disciple. Um, a lot of his, uh, a, a lot of people see him from the end of dying this this death at the hands of the Nazis in the same way people look back on World War II and the Nazis where we know the end and all the tragedy and stuff that's there but in the flux of history um that yeah that that didn't come out of nowhere it grew out of uh, the whole history of Protestantism and in Germany uh, the the kind of cultural and economic resentment that develops after World War 1 um this is a time after World War 1 where Germany is even developing its sense of selfhood uh, as a nation state because the the boundary lines and identity were different before that, and and he's a Christian that is born into a very intellectual upper middle class family, uh, and and uh, compared to his siblings and family, he ended up becoming devoutly religious, and you see in his story through the rise of um, the Nazis, uh, you see someone who. Um, has to start wrestling and asking theological questions that maybe he didn't have on his agenda early on. Um, and so the, the, the kind of like looking um, it's easy for us to look at the end and go, Oh, Nazis bad or, Oh, Bonhoeffer hero. Right. But his own story, uh, it to me kind of remains permanently compelling because he took seriously what was going on around him and it forced him to ask theological questions um, about, uh, about what's happening and over time, you see him struggling, wrestling, and then uh, ending up uh, taking stands in places that uh, who he was three or four years before couldn't have imagined. Um, yeah. And so when, when you think of all the challenges Christians are facing today, um, and both on the ethical sense about the changing relationship of religion and culture and such, he's someone who's wrestling um, led to a, a kind of faithfulness that that's inspiring, but also it, it took seriously, uh, 
throughout his life, an increasing number of other people's experience as a site for theological reflection. And, um, you know, in in modernity, uh, there there was a kind of introduction of experience as a site for theological reflection. But he kind of um, it, it isn't just his own. But there's a series throughout his life of engaging, uh, it, serving German churches, say in other countries, or mm. his time in New York and 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 learning the the black religious experience there, um, and and a host of these other things where the experience of the other uh, kind of forced on him uh, a kind of uh, a, a a site that demanded theological reflection, where he expanded his own vision, and in doing so, you know uh, what discipleship looks like, what faithfulness looks like, changes. Um, and and I guess the other way people know him is like his book, The Cost of Discipleship or Just mm-hmm. Discipleship uh, in the more recent translation is a Western spiritual classic. It's got a picture of him on the you know, the, the carving of him uh, on the big cathedral in London uh, next to the 20th century martyrs like Romero and such. So the, the he's has a place in consciousness uh, uh, also in large parts of the church. So it's not just like, oh, Germans know him or just Protestants or Lutherans or right. um, he's admired uh, in by a number of a very ecumenical community. So he's um, there's a kind of deep awareness to him. And, you know, what I think uh, Andy and I are hoping to do uh, at the lecture and using the kind of format of a salon where it's kind of interactive is invite people into these historical moments where where he's like in the process of becoming the one we project sainthood on mm-hmm. right or um uh, victoria barnett who's a, a general editor for the translation of bonhoeffer into english that whole series at fortress and um the one of the historians at the holocaust museum she talks about him as an unfinished hero and so the t- spending more time in those the historical narrative and seeing how he struggled with it, I think is helpful because a lot of Christians today, um, especially in America, are asking questions about the church and it's what does its public witness look like? What's faithfulness look like when there are tons of changes taking place and ugly expressions dominating the public square? He becomes an ally for us to think like, what is what is critical faithful reflection look like in his life? What can we learn from it? Um, and how can we take the experiences of of people and communities that aren't our own as sites for reflection uh, that can orient our own uh, discipleship? Yeah. Yeah, it really strikes me um, what you're talking about in terms of or, or I'm intrigued by the the extent to which Bonhoeffer had to discern and interpret his own time. Like in hindsight, it's very easy for us right from 21st century to look back at that time and say, well, obviously the Nazis were bad and Bonhoeffer is good. But the thing that I always think about and unfortunately have been thinking about more and more over the past decade or so of American history (laughs) or whatever we're living through right now is like the... Most of the Nazis didn't realize they were the Nazis, right? And we're going to go down in history as like humanity's greatest villain of the of the century. They were caught up in something in the moment and they were unable, many, many just rank and file people were unable to discern and see what was actually happening. Um, and, and so it sort of, I think, calls all of us to say, okay, the people who did discern it, who did see what was going on, what were they doing to be able to do that? And and what are the sorts of practices and ways of thinking about life and as Christians faith that keep us from being similarly blind? Because the majority of the German, you know, Protestant church was like all in. And one of the things uh i mean i've recently finished like the first draft of a a book on bonhoeffer and um i've been doing working on with jeffrey Pugh, who's written plenty on bonhoeffer and and such and so i i was the one learning the most in it you know uh yeah. versus putting a career's worth of reflection into a text sure. uh, and and one of the one of the things that has stuck out to me and trying to tell the his narrative at, in focusing on the way different moments in Germany's story occasion different questions, uh, ones that he he 
he autobiographically, he wouldn't have told the ability to ask that question previously. Um, so to me, like one of the features that sticks to that, that shows up throughout that is uh, uh, is is the moment um, when he, he finishes his second Ph.D., which you have to have to teach there uh, before he's old enough to teach. So now he's like got time. Right. Like, I guess if you're if you're so nerdy that you finish two Ph.D.s um, and in, in America, you would have just gotten the ability to drink. Uh, you, you have time to do. And he ends up in this time spending a lot of time in the ecumenical movement where he's serving Germans in other countries um, and he travels and visits Rome during uh, a Holy Week and participates in, in like as a German with this inheritance of like these critiques that, like, you know, Luther's critique of Rome and stuff. He's like overwhelmed by the aesthetics of it and the way their shape of piety and rhythm of life and the liturgy plays out. And he's like, oh, well, this is a bigger vision of Christianity. And I feel a part of it, even though after it, his buddy, who's a priest that they were going through it, they get a nice argument and rehearse Protestant Catholic fights. But there's like this different recognition of the spirit of God in a place where all of a sudden it became real as opposed to just the ideas, right? He's inheriting from his tradition. Same thing happens um, when he's there in Spain uh, in this kind of between time where he's serving a German church, but in another country. And he realizes how much of his own experience of being uh, a, a German, a Christian and things was shaped by the, the cultural zeitgeist of being the, the bad, the baddies after World War One, and what is it like when that's not what you're reminded of, and all the economic pressures of post World War One aren't driving on you, and they're attached to a different part of the European economy that's not has that great crazy inflation and such. And uh, what is it like to to occupy this tradition outside of this other context? Like, and, and I think of to me when I was reading that, it reminds me like I grew up in the South. I'm a Baptist preacher's kid, and as as Southern uh, as as it gets. Uh, like, but I moved and did my PhD in Los Angeles. And then I was teaching at the university of Edinburgh in Scotland and just what it means to be Christian when you're in these other contexts, all of a sudden you realize, well, half of what I was comfortable with was just being a Southern white guy. <laughs> right? Like which, which, those are just like the particular parts of this culture. And now you have to investigate it because they're actually forms of life who people who share your faith or even share your nationality in a different context. They relate to it different. And so I think these early um, experiences for him uh, made him draw uh, a, a kind of critical eye to the way um, if you if you haven't had those, it's easy for us to internalize our normal as natural, right? Like yeah. our normal, which is just our cultural, social context where you happen to be find yourself in the world, your family, class, race, gender, all those kinds of things where you are in time and all that kind of stuff there. Like you learn your world and then you never interpret. You've never experienced a world that isn't interpreted through the grid you learned when you learn language. And right. so these experiences make him go, oh, well, there's a gap here, right? Like mm. I participated in Holy Week in, in Rome and it was not just the critique of Luther uh, that was going through my head. Oh, like even Germans in another culture experience it differently. Oh, like I, he spends time in New York. So the, the I feel like those experiences forced on him a context where you have to separate the wheat and chaff of sorts from what you've inherited and having that going on hmm. while um, but this is before the, the Nazis really start driving uh, German politics, I think set him up for, for not just like, what's the correct answer? Like what is the Christian response, but going like, well, what do, what have we called Christian? That's really just being an upper middle class, uh, overeducated family, German uh, Lutheran or, like for me, like, what is it being a Baptist preacher's kid from the South? And now you just pretend all these other things. They're just part of the big bundle called trip. Um, it, it, and so the, the, the that we know uh, have this like inherent tendency to valorize his fidelity. I think the, that story and those questions and how he related to the experience of the other um, are also invitations for us to take the experience of the other seriously. Um, the first time I taught a online class on Bonhoeffer um, was right at the beginning of lockdown. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we're in lockdown. The Black Lives Matter movement is taking place. Uh, and so like rereading Bonhoeffer, someone I've been you know friends with in my head for all this time changes when he's asking you to to think about the experience of the other. 
So then what happens if he helps me think of the Black Lives Matter movement as a site of theological reflection? Um, it, it, like, How different do you see it rather than just going, oh, well, these kind of things associate with my deep value commitments. So I'll resonate with that part. Or or if you if they don't and you're just like, what's going on? This is uncomfortable. You know, the real solution to this is insert your theological solution for sin and then these things go away. Um, to me, part of what I've kind of continuously learned from Bonhoeffer is, uh, uh, the, the, how he raises and asks questions is kind of been permanently compelling to me. And then when other things are going on, returning to read him again and returning to wrestle with him again, helps me take, uh, like what's happening in the present and the experiences that others are giving voice to that I don't have, um, uh, seriously. And, you know, this isn't like a weird thing for Christians, right? Like theoretically, we all affirm everyone bears the image of God and everyone is addressed uh, by the divine and all these kinds of things. But if your cultural norm um, uh, has already filtered which experiences are valid for theological reflection, and if your filter, say for me, is at a predominantly rural white Baptist church that sings the same hymns as when slaves uh, we're in the back of the sanctuary and everything There's so much of a similar, maybe uh, tending to this experience in the present and being encouraged by Bonhoeffer raises those. So um, th like, I think you're right that, 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 that there's something uh, we miss if we don't realize just how situated even his own growth process is. And then what is it like to take that seriously uh, in our own context and, and reflection? So Tripp, I want to just explore that um, dimension a bit more with you around thinking about that relationship between gospel and culture. You know, our experience at Faith Lead working with a lot of church leaders is that often the conversation focuses on kind of how do we fix the institutional church and even, you know, the missional church movement, which emerged initially as a gospel and culture, how, you know, can the West be converted to Christianity, a culture that has rejected the gospel, right? Can it actually be, uh, what, what does a missionary encounter with Western culture look like? Um, but that conversation defaulted in many ways back to how do we just do church differently, right? And so, so I think Bonhoeffer is an interesting figure particularly as we dig into what we talk about as one of the key pivots of this shift from a focusing on sort of institutional church membership to actually focusing on discipleship, which you can't do without taking up what does it mean to follow Jesus as a distinct way of life in a culture that is powerfully formative in other ways, right? That is always forming us. Um, so dig deeper with us a little bit into Bonhoeffer's kind of emphasis on discipleship amidst this context of engaging the formative influences of culture that are actually very much contrary to God's vision and to Jesus's way. Yeah. I, I would think there's kind of like three things that come to mind initially uh, in response to that question with Bonhoeffer. The first is um, the, those early experiences in other cultures generated this desire. And, and you hear it in a few of the letters and papers where he's writing others about Yes, there's a, like there's this giant energy in liberal Protestantism uh, ex that he encountered of demythologizing the text where there's this recognition, right, that, well, what do you do with the tradition uh, when uh, the uh, the authors of the text and the way the tradition's been received uh, assumes such a different world picture um, than our own? Like, how do you get at the event of the gospel in it? Um, and. And he was, you know, interested in that and wrestles with it. But the, the he has this also sense where he's like, but there also needs to be a demythologizing of modernity that um, the that so often the church, uh, because it in many ways, it births what we know in, in the West of it, it, the, the notion of the subject that generates democracy, the notion of truth that emerge, like justifies and legitimates the early scientific uh, kind of exploration of nature and these kinds of things, it, it, those aren't value neutral. And and it's the raw like his experience in watching the rise of this radical kind of nationalism and militarism that makes him go like, well, it's not value neutral. So what what is just being assumed before and internalized into the life of the church where where we just ask the question right of mission or gospel on top of uh 
maybe like a, a a regime or form of life that is inherently idolatrous in Arians. <laughs> um, and and I think when we just t- pause there for Christians in America, that's something we are extremely uncomfortable doing. Uh, in part because so many of our denominations, our institutions, and such are formed at a time where the the distance between um, you know, mainline religion in America and the post World War II consensus, they were they, like they were like humming in harmony uh, in the, in this way where th- like then when we ask ourselves of like what did it look like when it went well, like if you don't question what's already been included into a, our ecclesiological self reflection um and uh, it, 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 whether or not it's problematic then then success is like how do we reinvigorate or reinstate um this other thriving time but we're increasingly aware of all the things that weren't thriving in that right so in the post world war 2 um uh consensus uh, that's where america's economic system um develops institutions after world war ii like the world bank and world trade organization that the liberation theologians were like have y'all paid attention to what happens uh when we you know get involved in your political and economic regime and um and american church was like oh we didn't really pay attention and so you get like carter and reagan training people to go s- kill <laughs> revolution like liber- liberation theologians uh with our guns and our training and such so, like there's this the, the, i think there's a lot the church hasn't asked and on top of that Unlike Germany, after World War II, they had this deep sense of like, we have to take seriously uh, the horror we brought in. When it goes to America, we haven't ever taken seriously uh, like transatlantic slave trade and the genocide of native peoples. That's not been something that's there. In fact, we actually see movements predominantly by Christians who resist even teaching it or framing it in that way. Right. And so the, when when we don't do that element of of asking what are the assumptions we have that break down before the cross, then it starts problematic. And I think the second thing when it goes to like mission culture and such um, Bonhoeffer, when he got back out of uh, back into Germany and he's like the equivalent of like a glorified professor that doesn't really get paid. um, And so he's serving uh, um, a working class uh, church in Berlin and on the faculty, but like trying to get fully recognized and get, positions and all this kind of stuff that's where he gets uh serving at this poor working class church and he realizes even though they represent the very people that are responding right to the early nazi movement where the economic repression the culture shift of cultural change is coming too fast for them and this resentment that shows up for legitimate reasons is now getting uh funneled right to this ugly expression when he's there and he actually gets to know them all of a sudden he realizes like well i didn't have something i tended to for their actual lived experience. I didn't taking the seriously the way um, like rampant inflation where you get paid half the day through because it will be worth less so they can go buy food so they can actually eat at night. Like that's going on in these students, families lives. Like no wonder they want to know who the problem is. No wonder there's like a desire of deep religious ang- angst that gets harnessed uh, out of these communities towards the other right here at Jews. But you can see it in a lot of American uh, culture where it gets harnessed towards immigrants or these kinds of things. Um, so the, he has those experiences and doesn't think the solution to it, if I take their experience seriously, is learn to say about it what me and my upper middle class German family say. Um, and and when we think of the way those of us that are mainline Protestants kind of pride ourselves and when we look at the past of being on the right side of, say, integration or like we were the, the denominations actually made stances of, of peace towards a number of wars that have happened since then, or all these kinds of things. I think we have the temptation to do uh, what Bonhoeffer did until he was doing doing uh, confirmation with working class kids in Germany and realizing, um, you know, uh, when our churches are full of graduate degrees, we probably don't know uh, what it's like uh, to have to uh go paycheck to paycheck and decide whether you get books for school, clothes for school or have three meals. Right. And so there's this, um, when it, when that happens in his life, then the question of what the gospel looks like, uh, what good news sounds like, uh, is no longer just what it would sound like in his socioeconomic cultural space. It also is, well, what is a working class family? Like what would be good news? Uh, what would be a solution to this? Um, 
and and in the the third big thing around like the gospel and culture uh for Bonhoeffer um is like he, he it's not till uh in the middle of the rise of of Nazis where he shifts from kind of more explicitly addressing theological idolatry, say the Fuhrer principle, or, oh, because the German church is connected to the state and we're going to have the Aryan uh, paragraph where, you, you know, you you can't really have mixed blood people. So, like, even initially it was like Jewish people who converted shouldn't be priests anymore because they work for the state. right? And, and he's like, this is not what our baptism does. Like, you can't, like, ask for, like, someone's DNA doesn't tell you whether they can be ordained. And, and that was a theological thing. But what he started to notice is that as the church was trying to be moderate on these issues and make space for different people and things, culture that it was increasingly moving and in, uh, to the energy that the Nazis have that that filters back into the church. So this kind of moderating move, but let's just address the theological part or just the specifically religious part meant that the church became a bystander for the growing um, uh, ethical problems. So like, if playing the moderate role and if sticking to theology and being, you know, insistent on, no, your baptism is what makes you a Christian or not, not your parents and all this kind of stuff. What it ultimately did was uh, when you aren't parsing uh, through your hermeneutics or your Christian hermeneutics around what's going on in culture is in the church made space where over in the in those years where the where the middle kept shifting more and more towards nationalism, more and more towards the perverse things on the outside. And so it's not till in the middle of his kind of engagement in that time where he thought, no, theology actually requires you to state publicly things that in the past, the especially upper middle class Germans would use the kind of two swords uh, doctrine of Luther uh, to mute talking about certain issues. And as someone that was, uh, I worked for nine years at a the largest UCC church in Los Angeles, uh, full of one percenters. I will just say we did that on a regular basis. We muted all sorts of things because uh, who we were talking to and who uh, and what we were speaking for was the part of the gospel that wouldn't offend or require fidelity um, to those people, uh, to the ones we were listening to. Right. And so it was these travel experiences. It was a context of service where the vision of the gospel started to change. And then he realized I'm actually accommodating to the ugly by narrowing what the gospel gets to speak about. Um, and then culture fills the vacuum. Uh, you can, you can see that in American religion where like, even if you follow like the trends uh, in like as evangelical church became culture dominant in religious spaces in America, initially the right, like the political organization and evangelicals was led by clergy and, and this kind of thing. And now it's flipped where you get increasing numbers of of the you get the self sorting of congregations and then the expectations that their preacher is going to voice their deep political commitments. And I, I mean, as someone that runs classes for thousands of clergy, I'll get them like, oh, I have no idea how my whole like I have like half my church now running around asking me to MAGA Jesus. And where did this come from? Like, you know, and they're like, I, I, I don't know. And so the, like we've got to a point now where I think. Those kind of questions of where kind of American individualism, the way we imagine uh, church and state things has led a kind of vacuous space in public theology that then the dominant expressions in culture fill that void. And what happens is then the church, the, the people in the church are now expecting the leaders to voice their political, cultural resentments back to them. And uh, and if they said, that's not where I'm going, that's not what I meant. You didn't read between the lines in my sermons the last 10 years and all that kind of stuff. They're going to go, no, nope, we need a new minister. Or we're going to go mm -hmm. to a different church. Uh, and that was what that was like Bonhoeffer's experience where all of a sudden, even people that were part of the Barman Declaration are like accommodating. And, and, and so what does he do? That's where you see this shift where he, like starting the seminary, uh, the, the underground what, he becomes the underground seminary. Uh, is is utterly fascinating. And so there are these bits in it where like he's like, no, no, discipleship has to be at the very heart of education and the life of the church. Um, and 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 it's even different than what we do. Right. When we do theological education, because, uh, yeah, there's like the whole tradition, learning it and stuff. But if you if you the more I the more I read about what happens uh, in it, they, um, his like part of his goal was 
we we want our students to graduate where there's both clarity about uh, our convictions, but also a deep group of friends who know because we've exegeted culture, because we've thought about these things, that you are not going to serve the German state and the 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 um, unexamined allegiances of your congregation. You're going to serve Christ. And it requires people. It requires these kind of deep friendships. So he integrates um, both like rhythms of devotion and stuff in it, but also deep play. Like they would go play and do stuff. They would uh, sing and have lots of fun. They would practice storytelling and get people to laugh. All the kinds of things that like while you're being formed, if you read life together and get that idea. But there's this whole other side of it where he was going. You need to graduate where there's a deep reservoir of friends um, who are disciples and mm -hmm. And he has this line, and it, I, I can't remember it exactly, but something like, um, uh, like the the theological education of the of clergy forgets that Jesus had disciples, and that was the only context for his ministry to the kingdom of God. And like, if you look at the trends in theological education, how many of our uh, like how many of our students get, will spend very few hours with their classmates? How many of our students? Um, could do the whole thing online. Like if you just look at how theological education is, is shifting, like, right? oh, it, it, you can connect with more people, more people can do this. But then you're like taking out like half of the things that for Bonhoeffer thought, this is what's required if you're going to have integrity in a culture. Once you've recognized how much of it has this kind of uh, demonic in the metaphorical sense energy. Um, and I think that same thing's true when it goes to the life of the church, right? If you just think, oh, let's get the church to work with well, it. It's like how many people are there and our donations or all these kinds of things. But if you're all there and you aren't building the relationships uh, and, and, and clarity of vision where you are going to be self-reflective and do it in community and have a community that helps one be faithful, be uh, self-giving or canonic in your form of life, giving, living on less for the benefit of other, all those kinds of things don't happen. Um, without uh, a community where these deep values are woven by intimate relationships. And and part of what's happening uh, culturally, and I think it's uh, amplified by uh, technology, is um, what are the things we can quantify and give to people and then becoming a spectator or a, 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 like a, um, a where you a spectator or you're you're kind of like, oh, this is an influencer that I'm following. Are the all these kinds of things are means of of describing an identity, but those don't come where in the context of relationships uh, that that the kind of transformation and fortitude Bonhoeffer thought was necessary happen. Yeah, you have you have parasocial relationships as opposed to like deep actual relationships with one another. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was like why when I was talking with Andy about the lecture thing, I was like, well, let's try it in a salon format. So as opposed to people watching mm -hmm. like, oh, well, Tripp's going to give a talk and then they answer some questions. But then there's this meal before it. Let's do the whole thing together so that it, it kind of goes back and forth. And then the students, when they have their intensives at Luther, like, yeah, there's the intensives in the classroom. And hopefully we don't bore you lecturing for six hours in a day or whatever. Um but at the meal, like, how can we have the ideas and things where, that are being introduced also provoke conversations where at the table, the people you know are forming themselves vocationally or talking about, like, the face of the other and how it in their own life. And, like, how is that a site for theological reflection? And so, it, like, it, the, the idea when Andy and I were talking about, I was like, what if we did, instead of, like, a normal lecture and that kind of thing, we tried to, like, how would Bonhoeffer, if there were seminary intensives, utilize the time and relationships where when you see them on your Facebook feed, that's also a person where you said, I've never considered Black Lives Matter as a site of theological reflection. And Bonhoeffer didn't until he went to a black church in New York. Yeah. And uh, like having relationships with that happen. Anyway, that's yeah. So yeah, no, that was a long answer. No, no, no. That's I mean, that's very helpful. And um, just a quick note that if you are joining us live online, we're also doing we're going to have facilitated salon type conversations as well, which isn't quite as good as the real thing is like sitting down and, and eating together. But there will be a piece of that. One, one thing I want to pick up on um, in what you've said, uh, specifically when talking about an, uh, the other and attention that I 
feel in my own life and ministry, as well as I, I think I see it uh, in colleagues and in the world uh, around me is there were a couple things that you said, like on the one hand, you talked about how Bonhoeffer goes into the communities where there's resentment and where there's um, where there's anxiety, economic anxiety, these sorts of things, and how how him being present in the communities where resentment is building helps him have a different perspective or is able to, what, what, what I sort of took from that is that he's able to kind of humanize the people there as opposed to viewing them as like a, a faceless, you know, other. And then at the same time, um, you know, he realizes more and more um, that he needs to speak specifically to some of the things, the evils that are being perpetuated actually politically and not just um and not just uh theologically or rather maybe approaching the politics from a theological perspective and i know that like for a, a lot of folks and clergy like i think we feel this tension between saying like it's so easy to do the second thing by dehumanizing the people that do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's so easy to be like, I got to speak prophetically in this moment. And in the process, I do it uh, by proclaiming my own resentment toward the people that I'm supposed to be serving and loving. And so I wonder if there's anything, you know, anything there. It, it's, it's, uh, it can be easy to have compassion for the distant other, but what about like the closer <laughs> other that you're, really frustrated with in the moment yeah you know what i'm saying yeah yeah the, the, so um towards the end like right within the year of him getting arrested i don't remember the exact day but it was 43 it was in 1943 mm -hmm. so like close to when he gets arrested he wrote this uh letter to his like three closest friends that are apart uh it, the, in some way tangentially connected to the conspiracy um and uh and in it he's writing this from uh, he went basically on a retreat to a monastery. And this is something we've learned recently that it it kind of blew my mind. So he's at this monastery and he wrote this letter. And there's like when you don't know the whole context, you read it in one way. Um, and then when you realize that this monastery, the the German army had um, basically put Polish slaves working at this monastery. So he's staying at a monastery where there's. Oh, there, there's even a particular fa a whole family there. So even the kids, right, are um, like now slave labor uh, for the monastery. And that's where he's writing this from. And in it, um, at the beginning of it, he gives this line uh, where he's talking about the, one of the elements you were raising, like this need to view uh, things from below. And he's here's the quote. He says, it remains an experience of incomparable value that we have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the outcast, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed and reviled in short, from the perspective of suffering. Right. And that's like when he's sitting there and saying it, and yet he realizes he's even complicit in this system and benefiting right from Polish slaves, the Nazi army left there. And so in like two sections later, it's a short, letter i mean it's a theological letter to his friends um he then raises the the other question i think you're raising around contempt that can generate from a kind of confidence uh in your parsing um and where he's basically he's trying to argue that failing to see other human beings from the perspective of their suffering uh can lead us to have contempt for others and mm -hmm. a contempt that uh generates a kind of condensation uh, or, or like um where where you're like, oh, I'm just I'm like super judgy. And if I'm just judgy, then I don't have to engage and I can dismiss their own situation. And there he says, uh, nothing of what we despise in another is itself foreign to us. Hmm. So they they can he's wanting you to go like you are always already embedded in this system. So even if you're recognizing these questions and raising them and think they're essential to the gospel, just know you're indicting yourself even if it's not like in the same way and, and, and such. Um, and 
and, and then he says, we must learn to regard human beings less in terms of what they do and neglect to do and more in terms of what they suffer. Hmm. Um, and, and for him, the, uh, the, at the end of that section, he says um, that, that relationships and the will to find community are best built on love because God did not hold human beings in contempt, but became human for their sake. And so you can see there, right? There's this, the view of suffering that helps us diagnose and understand the situation. But then, right, the view of suffering is established in God's self-giving all the way to the cross. So then he inverts it and then says, um, you, can't, you cannot cultivate contempt and high-mindedness towards these others. Uh, even if your convictions are strong, because uh, contempt was an option for God, the holy loving one for the sinner. And since that's not what God did, it's above your pay grade to do the same. And so th there's this, uh, the, the, like that to me, writing that, right? Sitting there at a place where he realizes all his work right up to being, you know, arrested he is just inscribed in the system is just as complicit um, in all these ways. Uh, so like the cruciform uh, hermeneutic isn't just uh, like the solidarity with the underside, but also um, that, that, that yes, perspective from the victim. But when the victim is Jesus, he teaches us how to see his enemy. Like you pray for your enemy. Uh, you, you are, you're the entire story of God is the reconciliation of all things. And so I think that the his kind of like those two moves um, at, that are grounded in his Christology are actually offensive to the kind of performative politics um, uh, of the culture war, right? Because uh, in many ways, um, the, the culture war is uh, uh, Puritan ethical angst without grace. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and so the, the, he sets this thing up and then at the end of that section, this is his, which I before didn't read this as him doing a confession, but once you know what's going on there, right? Like that, that he's on retreat writing this with Polish slaves serving him at a monastery. He says, um, it remains an experience of incomparable value. Uh, oh, oh wait, no, that not that. That was not the line out. I scrolled past it. He goes, um, what has there ever been a people in history who in their time, like us, had so little ground on under their feet, people to whom every possible alternative open to them at the time appeared equally unbearable, senseless and contrary to life. So it, like he's sitting there, you could even be clear on their ethical visions. But then he's like, well, should we have done something earlier? Have we done enough? And now look, I'm sitting here thinking about this while they're Polish slave uh, serving at a monastery and the monastery probably said yes. Cause they didn't want to be shut down and killed themselves. Right. Like, and then you're, you're sitting there asking these questions. And then he says, um, a face we're facing a great historical turning point. Did the responsible thinkers of another generation ever feel differently than we do today? Precisely because something genuinely new was forming, uh, that was not yet apparent in the existing alternatives. And to me, like when you think of your question and the one Dwight asked before, uh, I think he invites us to to both like have the two inversions when it goes to a Christological hermeneutic and recognize that in times of great transition and such, sometimes what you're dreaming of or what the solutions or what isn't even available to you. So like you don't have ground beneath your feet. You could feel like you're the least grounded one of all. Um, and if you need a solution and if your horizon that is required to inspire you is so far ahead, uh, then where do you even put the next step? Right. And so that Christological hermeneutic, I think invites us to, to take, to take seriously our discipleship precisely by knowing the asking, what is the next faithful step without having to have like the 10 year plan for X, Y, and Z though. Uh, if you're, if your trustees want one, it's always good to do one uh, quoting Bonhoeffer, Adam and telling them we'll do it later. Probably not best for job security but does that make sense like i i find that essay uh it like as we were going through this um book project and and such really helpful um yeah. because it 
it it wants ethic it's demanding to do ethical reflection and clarity but it's also saying like you could not dehumanize another person since god has humanized even even the ones that executed jesus right father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing but that's but they don't know what they're doing. It is wrong. It is immoral. It, this is wrong. It's on the wrong side of history or whatever way you want. But but you didn't say that until you first recognize that the one revealed in Christ knows the, knows the vic- violator and the victim's name and loves them completely. And hmm. that, I think, orients us in a very different way um, because uh, so often, or, or at least this is how I experience it, is in per- more progressive Christian spaces, it's easy to do your uh, uh, to do your prophetic voice in ways only your neighbors are condemned, um, mm-hmm. and and do your celebration where you're essentially lifting yourself above others, yeah. and and like that line from the cross, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do," uh, is is like Jesus enacting that kind of double move of Christological hermeneutics. Um, and it's extremely tricky to do in a congregation, right? And you know when it, it and it's way more likely if they actually know you give a or I'm sorry I forgot this is not home. I didn't want to curse on your pocket, but if you no. if they know you actually care about them exactly. and that you weren't crossing your fingers when you baptized them, yeah. and that you know when you serve the Eucharist you would serve it to Judas. If Jesus can offer it to Judas, then you can offer it to insert the culture war opponent uh, that happens to be there. Um, but but he was offering it to to people that were going to deny him, were going to betray him, and he was going to death. So there wasn't lack of clarity about his mission or what the kingdom of God looked like in that context. But none none of the big questions, right? Like, and this is one of the things I love about Paul. And Bonhoeffer actually picks up on this when he's doing his theological riff in Creation in the Fall, like when he's going through those texts, is conquering sin, law, and death are not conquering humans. Sin, law, and death are the things that pervert um, our relations. But what God desires, like, and you can see in First Corinthians, in First Corinthians fifteen, you know, a lot of people obsess about the beginning part, about like the nature of the resurrection and its importance. But like when He talks about the the impact of it, it's sin, law, and death are being conquered, subject to the Son, Son to the Father, so that God's all in all. It's not like God's all in all except the enemies, or God's all in all except for the just in my tribe. It's like all that's identifiable through the resurrection is identified in the very relations of the divine, and if that is our horizon. Like that's a different horizon for our mission than our institution, our body, our church, our historical moment, and these kind of things. Um, and, but that only that only becomes possible, I think, in communities where uh, the one making uh, the the one helping us take seriously the prophetic energy of the text is also the one who confidently proclaims our identity as the beloved of God um, uh, right after our confession. And so, um, yeah, sorry. That w- I'm giving long answers. I'm very not helpful. a good podcast guest. Well, it's or, very helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. A lot to well, think about there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so rich, Tripp, and, and what you're um, laying out is really an invitation for all of us to, as, you know, church leaders are navigating this very fraught political season and this moment in our, in our history and our, in our society to um to step back and do that deeper reflection theologically about what's taking place and so trip thank you so much for joining us on the pivot podcast today glad to be here yeah great and and to our audience thank you so much for um for joining us today as well remember you can head to faithly.org if you want to have access to more of the bonhoeffer resources we have there including there's a Faith Lead Academy course that Andrew Root did that is actually filmed on site in Germany in the places that Bonhoeffer lived and worked and um, led his life. So um, you can also at faithly.org register for Tripp's lecture and conversation with Andy Root on Bonhoeffer. So all that we've kind of previewed today in a sense or had a taste of, you'll get to hear a lot more of in that OS lecture in, in June. One, one quick thing about that, I would just say is if you're interested, um, the so there'll be these little moments that Andy and I set up. We'll talk a little bit, and then there'll be discussion tables. Some will happen in Zoom. One of the other things that can happen is if you have a few friends that are coming over, um, you can you know not join the Zoom room, do, and there's a discussion guide, so no, you can just have idea. it. You know, talk with the people that are together in your group, and then you know it goes back. So 
this is an experiment, but it's kind of cool because uh, when when I was talking, you know, was talking with you all about it, like Faith Lead Team likes trying out different ex- these kind of experiments of technology, theological learning. And so if the the hard pitch of introducing Bonhoeffer and community and building relationships sounds intriguing. And you and you think, well, if I did it with my whole congregation, I'd get myself fired quickly. But you could probably think of four or five people who, if you did it at a home, shoot up the YouTube stream or whatever on your TV and then gets to the discussion guide. You got them printed out. And now um, this is my thing when I was clergy, like there's one bit right of introducing context stuff. And now you've offended them or challenged them. And now they're going to have a hard time sharing. But when we're hoping to have it built where all of it gets framed. So then if you're hosting it live or after that you as the clergy are actually playing the pastoral role. Like what is it like as a community to wrestle with Bonhoeffer and these challenges and such? Um, and I think this format and uh, this little experiment could be, could be a lot of fun. So it's a cool idea. Host a watch party folks. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Thank you for joining us on today's Pivot Podcast. Um, if you like Pivot, please help us spread the word by liking subscribe, and subscribing on YouTube. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, go ahead and leave a review. Finally, the best compliment you can give us is to share Pivot with a friend. So until next time, this is Dwight Shiley and Katie Langston signing off. <laughs>